Okay, um, I'm probably going to going to speed things up. I think, considering how slow uh, this is, uh, you know, a false start. Let's call it. Um, so um, here we go then. You're right. So I'm starting with an image I've never ever shown. Uh, some of you, if you've been to the um, uh, the Rome Museum in Henley, you may recognise this. It's uh, uh, a late 17th century painting, which is there, and it shows um, the, it shows a lock at at Henley, or just close to Henley, indeed. Uh, and it's a flash lock. What you will um, notice is, I hope, uh, the, the, the barge, and it is a barge, you can see from the width of it, uh, this is not a narrow boat like uh, we will be talking about a little bit later on the Oxford Canal, um, is um, not in a pound lock. It's not in a, a lock as we would recognise it because uh, the barrier is only at the um, you know the top end of it, it's going upstream there. Uh, this is a flash lock, uh, the sort of locks that were in place all along the Thames pretty much until uh, the canals kind of um, caught the imagination. We'll come back to flash locks uh, later on, but um, it's just uh, such a beautiful image uh, and it shows landscape, uh, form, it shows uh, the difficulties, I think, all in this image of uh, moving heavy loads, uh, particularly upstream, where you just have these rather simple uh, flash lock barriers, uh, which had to be removed uh, to let the boats through. But then, of course, the water that was penned back uh, then went off in a, a flash of water or a flush of water, uh, causing, you know, some difficulties for any uh, farmers or millers or fishing uh, people further downstream because of that, uh, the nature of that uh, flow of water. Okay, next. Oh. <laughs> Just one moment. So we'll start. We will start on the canal, um, and then come on to the river. And so say it's it's sort of chronological, but not entirely, and uh, sort of mainly geographical as we'll sort of work our way uh, north to south, essentially. Uh, James Brindley, I. I, I'm very pleased that Brinley does get a little bit of a commemoration in the new waterside um, developments alongside the canal in Oxford. Uh, you know, he was the uh, the brilliant individual who uh, whose brainchild it was really to who's responsible, let's say, for a lot of what was good about the early canal systems. Um, not particularly well educated, but uh, he has this kind of instinctive understanding, it would seem, of um, surveying and uh, uh, physics and so on and engineering. So um, he comes to the fore really with this this in the 1750s with this drainage scheme, uh, which is very close to uh, where the Duke of Bridgewater uh, had a coal mine at Worsley. And uh, that sort of coincidence almost of uh, uh, geographical proximity then uh, leads to all sorts of great things. I think it's true to say, uh, because uh, although uh, Brindley had um, been summoned really by Josiah Wedgwood, uh, a little bit earlier in 1758, uh, his first major canal project was uh, the Duke of Bridgewaters, which is known as the, uh, you know, the first British canal. Um, that's maybe debatable, but uh, that's, you know, essentially uh, in terms of a commercial waterway, that is true, I think. Um, then uh, next. Um, and as a result of the success of that, the Bridgewater, uh, Brindley was then kind of um, brought in to look at a national scheme. And his idea was to have this cross of canals, uh, which you can see uh, depicted to some extent with the, um, the, the cities that I've highlighted in yellow in this map, uh, St Andrews kind of cross meeting in the Midlands, the Birmingham area where, uh, you know, one of the cradles of the industrial revolution was occurring, uh, manufactured goods, coal, uh, heavy materials, which needed to be transported outwards from the centre of the country. And so uh, onwards from that first Bridgewater Canal, uh, you get the Trent and Mersey, 
uh, canal linking Liverpool with the Midlands and then linking in, you know, artificial waterways connecting then to the natural rivers uh, up to Hull in the northeast and uh, eventually down to Bristol. And uh, it's the Oxford Canal, which is the, um, uh, the fourth part of this cross of canals, uh, which actually is heading uh, towards the most important of the markets, which are, is London. Uh, but the other important thing, apart from his um, vision uh, in that sense, is that Brindley had uh, pretty much decided, it was down to Brindley really, that, that the boat, the size of the boats was decided. Uh, and that is what we have still to this day, uh, a maximum boat length of 72 feet and uh, a width of, well, just under seven feet. So that's why uh, the narrow locks look how they do uh, that when you think of the hundreds of locks that are uh, on the narrow canals uh, through uh, the country they all it's all down to him in a sense of having that um, you know that's why they look uh, how they do and there is a distinction between uh, the broad canals and the, the narrow ones uh, which I won't dwell on too much but uh, anybody that's sort of looked at canals will kind of realize that um, what else is going on? Well, uh, so by 1780, and now Brindley died in 1772, so he didn't see the uh, completion of his great vision, but it was carried on by others. And um, I've just slotted in that mention of William Smith as a bit of a spoiler for your next talk, um, which you've just been hearing about, uh, because Smith has a, a very important, or canals rather, let's put it that way around, canals have a very important uh, influence on Smith, because when he was uh, surveying uh, the digging of the Somerset Coal Canal in the 1790s. It was then that this uh, he had this sort of brainwave about uh, geological strata. I'll say no more because uh, that's your next talk. Um, so uh, that's Oxford Canal, uh, which is Brindley's design. Brindley surveyed it. He chose most of the route, uh, starting as the the, um, uh, the Coventry Canal. You can see there. Then the Oxford Canal. Uh, that was the shortest water route to London until. 1805 when uh, the more direct uh, Grand Junction Canal opened and that was a wide canal. Uh, the uh, Oxford uh, is, as we'll see I think in the next slide, uh, uh, is, is a contour canal. There's uh, uh, two options really, two principal options. Um, so let's go to the next one, uh, David. Uh, oh no, we'll see it in a moment or two. I'll, I'll come back to that point in a moment. Do, do excuse both the, um, the full start on this talk and the fact that um, I'm, I'm having to try and guess what slide comes next myself. It's, uh, uh, this talk has been put together specifically for this evening. So uh, Brindley put his money where his uh, mouth was in a sense. He uh, was a shareholder. Bear in mind the canals were um, uh, capital, capital projects, they needed financing from individual shareholders and um, it was a gamble, a little bit of a gamble, but uh, ultimately anybody who bought shares in these early canals did very nicely. Thank you. And um, Brindley's name you'll see in that first uh, alphabetical list of uh, shareholders where the, the bottom arrow is uh, £3,000 worth. So that's 30 100 pound uh, shares. Uh, you've got uh, the Marcus of Blandford and the Duke of Marlborough uh, buying the maximum number of uh, shares possible. That's because uh, the canal was destined to go through uh, a lot of their property, a lot of their land holding. And so there was a, you know, a vested interest there. And then I've also just uh, mentioned on this image, uh, Elizabeth Bradley, uh, one of the few women uh, who were uh, on these early uh, lists of shareholders, uh, and Dr. Thomas Noel. Now, Noel is a, a local Ifley person, as you may or may not know, uh, who's, um, when he died, his Oxford Canal shares funded uh, the school that his wife was very uh, enthused by in Ifley, the Ifley school, um, charity school there. Um, so I thought I'd just uh, mention that in passing. Um, okay, thanks. Next. Um, and before we kind of leave Brindley, uh, let me just explain one of the two quotes uh, that I decided 
you know, on a bit of a whim uh, to, to give the title of this talk. Uh, and it comes from this uh, poem by Erasmus Darwin, uh, grandfather of Charles. Um, and although it's quite neat, uh, winding in lucid lines, I personally think it would have been better if he'd put lucid lanes. But there you are. Um, he went for lines. Uh, lanes is kind of more visually descriptive, I think. Uh, and indeed, lines is not quite correct, as I was uh, you know, alluding to a bit earlier. Uh, it could be for some canals, but actually in the case of the Oxford Canal, uh, let's go to the next. Um, as you can see now from this map, uh, it isn't exactly because Brindley's choice uh, was to build a contour canal. In other words, uh, behaving more like a river than uh, a linear waterway cutting straight through the landscape, which uh, some other canals do. Um, the, the, the pros and cons of this are that um, the contour canal required far fewer locks and aqueducts and tunnels and so forth that cutting straight through uh, different aspects of an undulating landscape might require, but it does make the waterway as a whole uh, that much longer because you're doing long winding detours. You can see perhaps uh, towards the top there uh, where you've got Wormleton, uh, you've got that big loop, uh, which actually, you know, uh, other canal uh, constructors might well have just cut straight through that, uh, made it much shorter, but probably would have had to have put in a few expensive locks uh, in order to do so. And the canal was uh, shortened uh, in the 1820s indeed, uh, later on in order to you know, compensate for that exact problem of uh, uh, trying to shorten the route and therefore make it quicker for the different uh, barge uh, users. Uh, Brindley died in uh, 1772, as I say, um, so he didn't actually see the completion of his uh, of his um, you know great uh, grand cross of canals. Uh, let's uh, move. Down, well, let's just mention this uh, map. Uh, you can see, I hope, uh, the canal coming in just at the top there at um, Duke's Lock, and. That was where the first connection with the Thames was created. So that's an artificial uh, bit of the short bit of artificial canal waterway, which uh, links to uh, the natural side streams of the River Thames. And it's called the Duke's Cut because it was, you know, the, the Duke of Marlborough, whose uh, uh, paper mill it was uh, intended to get to. And that has had the fact that has had then a, a, a long ongoing knock-on effect, I think, on the landscape of that particular area. You know, had the Duke not been enthused, had he not been a shareholder, you know, quite possibly that uh, connecting waterway might well not have uh, been created and uh, the connection with the Thames, which we'll come to shortly, uh, might well have ended up elsewhere. But um, as it was, uh, next please. Uh, there is uh, the view on the left from the River Thames, from uh, the King's Lock uh, towards uh, the paper mill with the, the chimney showing uh, over the fields there. Uh, the Duke's Cut itself is on the far side, so we're, we're looking in the we're looking in a westerly direct, uh, sorry, easterly direction here, uh, and the boats traffic coming off the canal, uh, providing coal uh, for the chimney. You can see the smoke coming out of the chimney there. Uh, highly important to that uh, paper mill, which subsequently became uh, a very important resource for the Oxford University Press, which uh, in this image you can see uh, right in the distance where that other little chimney is, uh, you know, a view that you can't possibly get now today because the university have kindly put those horrible flats in the way, but there you are. And the chimney, of course, doesn't exist at the University Press any longer. But... Um, uh, that is, therefore, um, nonetheless, um, uh, 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 an influence on uh, the views that have subsequently followed. So say, had the paper mill not been owned, owned by the Duke, then probably that I can't see why that connection would have been made. It might have been, but um, they may well have found other ways. Um, OK, yeah, uh, next. <clears throat> uh, so that was 
one uh, connection with the Thames even before uh, the canal was completed right into the centre of Oxford. Uh, and on that score, the, 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 there was a different idea to the one that has subsequently uh, materialised. Uh, this is a, uh, a sketch plan from 1779, which uh, shows uh, a rather different plan for how the canal terminus uh, was envisaged coming into Oxford. Uh, you can pick out Port Meadow at the bottom there, I think, and um, uh, what's, the, what, what the, what's been labelled the River Isis, uh, what we think of today as the uh, Castle Mill Stream uh, flowing down from the southern end of um, uh, Port Meadow. Uh, the observatory building you can see there, and two branches of the canal. That was one idea at the time. Well, three in a way, actually, because what you have uh, as you go from left to right is uh, the black line going from top to bottom, joining the River Thames. So that would have been uh, another connection with the River Thames. Uh, the next one going uh, in an easterly direction upwards uh, right into University Parks as a, another possible terminus. And then the third one, uh, closer to what we'd actually have today, uh, going very logically actually uh, to uh, Gloucester Green, where, you know, the a central marketplace uh, uh, bypassing uh, the House of Industry which uh, again is kind of interesting. That's where Wellington Square now is uh, on Rats and Mice Hill, as it's called, as it was called rather. Uh, there was a house of industry there. And indeed um, one of the clearly uh, labor was brought from uh, the workhouse there, the house of industry to work on the canal as it was being completed because we have something called the workhouse bridge as one of the um, lift bridges coming into the canal, which actually ultimately followed the course uh, uh, below the one we're looking at, uh, flowing um, below Worcester College, as we'll see, I think, uh, with the next image. Yeah, so here, now you've got the map uh, a, a bit more logic, uh, a bit more comfortably uh, uh, aligned with north at the top, uh, which will help you get your bearings better. So Worcester College is shown right in the middle there. And that plan, that sort of three way split of the canal uh, a little bit north from here was abandoned and uh, the decision was made. Uh, faithfully to uh, bring it in along parallel to uh, the river called the Castle Mill Stream, uh, which is the main river flowing right through the centre of this map. Um, and that then has uh, a number of repercussions, of course, in terms of um, the urban landscape that uh, evolves as a result. Uh, before we just go on to that briefly, uh, I've highlighted a few uh, points in this map by Richard Davis. Uh, if we start at the top, we're going to come back to the sheep wash because that uh, becomes a very important uh, waterway. Uh, it always had been uh, a little a branch of the River Thames uh, carrying freight traffic. Uh, but the fact that the uh, connection with the Thames was, was, was delayed and made right here in the centre of Oxford rather than that 1779 idea of connecting near Port Meadow uh, does have an impact on the sheep wash. Um, then um, uh, the, the, the top arrow on the right, if you follow your, your eye straight across, you'll come, hopefully you can just see it just above high, what's called High Bridge. We think of it as Hyther Bridge today. Uh, there's a lock shown. We'll come back to that in a moment. That was a connecting lock uh, between the River Thames and the canal. Um, you've got a warehouse shown a little bit below that. Come back to that in a moment. And then the castle. Um, uh, Elizabeth mentioned Daniel Harris, the uh, person who I spoke to you about uh, a, a while ago. Uh, so this is where uh, this is where and why Daniel Harris and his prisoners become uh, rather more involved than perhaps otherwise, because the canal is coming right in, right onto their doorstep, as it were. Okay, next. Um, and 
the fact of the, the canal following the route that was chosen in the end uh, then means that um, that very rare thing in Oxford, uh, industrial um, enterprise, uh, kind of follows it a little bit here in Jericho. So this is Lucy's uh, some years ago before, uh, you know, completely refurbished and turned into the luxury flats uh, that we know are on this location now. Um, had the canal gone in a different direction, then uh, I then presumably that's you know that would have changed all of the uh, ideas about uh, where the ironworks would have been sited. Because certainly, although Lucy's rather optimistically give a, a founding date of 1760 in some of their literature, it's quite clear that that's um, that's not. You know, that's not, I, I, well, that, I know where that date has come from, but it's not uh, the date that uh, the ironworks themselves were founded on this location, uh, which is 1812. And um, it's because of that, that uh, it's, sorry, it's because of the canal, clearly, that, uh, th that the advantage of moving uh, coal to smelt the iron and then moving the heavy materials out, uh, clearly it was the uh, location close to the canal, uh, which was the attractive uh, reason to do that. Sorry, uh, 1825, I should have said, uh, was the founding date. Um, then the knock-on effect a bit further into town. Uh, next, please, as we carry on, uh, is that you then get this, this cluster of um, warehousing buildings of wharfs and so on in this location. Uh, not so far from Gloucester Green, of course, so uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily have uh, shifted all that much in terms of uh, geographical location. But nonetheless, you get this, um, you know, that, that's what's that's what's occurred. Uh, and it's uh, the building that is following the decisions about which route to bring the waterway into the centre of Oxford that, um, that are the critical factor. Uh, the warehouse there is one built by Daniel Harris. There's the little image of him. Uh, you will know a little bit about him, I hope, if you uh, attended my talk about him. Um, and it's rather pleasing, I suppose, in a way that, uh, that this did happen because, uh, you know, uh, the fact that the canal came into this sort of fairly central part of Oxford means that we did get these, uh, you know, these largely attractive, certainly the warehouse is a, was a very attractive building. Otherwise, um, next. Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, so just a, a little plug, one of uh, several that I shall make, a uh, little commercial <laughs> break, I've forgotten about that, uh, just to mention uh, that should you be interested this, uh, this uh, about the canal uh, and Daniel Harris and the prisoners input into the canal, uh, my book uh, will tell you quite a lot. Uh, so yes, next. Um, yeah, I mean, could have been something horrible uh, had occurred, might have occurred on that site, like a car park had uh, the canal not decided to come into there. Well, it did anyway, and uh, that is rather sad uh, that um, the waterway origins of that location have been completely uh, lost, really. You know, most casual visitors would have no idea. Uh, indeed, I know that, you know, from the guided walks I do. Uh, you know, what a... You know what a what a what a boon it was to the city actually initially to have this very central uh, area, particularly for coal. Uh, next, um, so back to cast your mind back to the map I showed you a couple of um, slides ago. Uh, the lock is shown in this uh, wonderful painting, uh, which is the original is at the Museum of Oxford uh, on the left, but it's like. Um, the, it's similar in principle to the lock that I mentioned down at Henley, the first one, the flash lock. It, all it's got is two, uh, is a single barrier of gates. And uh, the artist has shown uh, in this the, uh, the water sort of, um, in, in, sort of flowing over the top by the looks of it, the gate, which seems a bit unlikely. But anyway, um, it's a highly inefficient process to get uh, narrowboats up onto the canal or even down off it, uh, you know, every time the gate was opened, you'd get, the canal would just lose a whole lot of water. So uh, another uh, option was required. And it, it, it is a bit strange because all the way down the canal, all the way, the 90 odd miles of canal, uh, they had put pound locks. They put these very sensible locks 
with two gates, which means a very smooth passage for boats. Uh, a finite amount of water is passed on with each passage of a boat. And yet, right at the end, uh, they didn't do that. They put this, um, you know, this inadequate and uh, inefficient uh, single pair of gates. So uh, a solution was needed. And it's uh, next place. And it's uh, Daniel Harris again who kind of steps into the fore by uh, creating what was called at the time a barge lock at uh, a little bit further north. Uh, it's a barge lock because uh, not only would it therefore allow the narrow boats to go through, it would also uh, enable the barges, the wider boats uh, from the River Thames to come into the city centre uh, to facilitate trade. So this is the only image we have of the original lock at the location, uh, which I'll show you next, please. Um, uh, which is uh, Isis Lock, uh, as it's now known. Um, this beautiful painting of it, as you can see, uh, is looking down towards the city. The uh, turnover bridge there uh, is still visible today. Uh, and it's been narrowed by the time that image is shown. So the photograph as well shows it as a narrow, narrow lock. Uh, designed for the uh, boats which are travelling up and down the narrow canal of the Oxford Canal. Um, again, it's my towpath book, which will uh, give you a bit of information about uh, all of that aspect, uh, the terminus, the, uh, the canal as it comes into Oxford and the history of Isis Lock. But the boat in the photograph there is doing essentially what uh, boats did for, uh, well, throughout its the history of the, uh, or, uh, the of the building of the lock, uh, which was built by prisoners, uh, but also uh, what other boats and barges indeed had done prior to that. Because if you look down now at the uh, painting, you've got the canal on the left and you've got the natural river, the Castle Mill stream on the right. And that formed part of the main River Thames, that, uh, that waterway on the right hand side of the painting. Uh, but at this point, uh, they would, the boats would have to take a sharp right turn. Um, and we'll come to that in a moment, but I think I did want to just, uh, yeah, uh, but it did, I, I mentioned about the sheep wash channel, which is what that boat is about to turn onto, that little narrow boat, uh, becoming an important waterway uh, for that reason. Um, next, please. And not only that, because it did become an important waterway, both uh, mainly because of uh, being the, uh, the bit of waterway that connects the Oxford Canal boats with the River Thames, uh, it meant that uh, it stayed of a size which uh, would have otherwise, I think, probably not have necessitated this amazing bit of Victorian engineering. Uh, again, if you cast your mind back to the fact that we could have had the connection lock right up at Port Meadow, uh, there was already the one up at Duke's Cut, um, there would have been little point in having a, a third connection here. So I suspect this sheep washed uh, waterway would have uh, dwindled away to something minor. And um, then we would have been robbed of the uh, amazing bit of Victorian engineering that the swing bridge there uh, is, um, is now you know, proudly being able to uh, pro proclaim itself with uh, the funding and the efforts of the Oxford Preservation Trust. Uh, if you haven't been down to have a look uh, recently, please do, because it's, um, you know, it's looking, uh, it's not in its finished state yet, but it's, uh, it's getting there. Uh, so boats heading in the direction that we're looking under the railway bridge uh, will then get onto uh, the main, what we think of today as the main River Thames, but historically, as you'll see from the next map, uh, next, um, was not. Now, this is a terrible map. It really is. It's a really rough and ready thing, I have to point out. But uh, it does show rather beautifully uh, the loop that the barges and the boats uh, were required to make in order to get from one side of Oxford to the other. Um, uh, it's going to be a bit, bit confusing, perhaps, if I had a cursor, I could point it out a bit better. But you can see, you know, you can see that big loop going uh, to the left there, going out to the west. Uh, that's the main River Thames, essentially. Uh, it's what is today known as the Bullstake Stream. 
And in 1761, right through to, uh, well, 1790, essentially, that was the, the tortuous way, uh, going under several bridges, as you can see, because the river is um, having to go under uh, the Botley Road, another road, um, and the road out to Hinksy. You know, really tricky for heavily loaded barges to uh, do that journey. So um, it was the creation of Ifley Lock, which uh, is which is not worth pointing out in this map because it's uh, it, it's in sort of the map is drawn in uh, a very bad way as i say uh, uh, it's the creation of Os osney lock however which uh, enabled the boats to make a much shorter much quicker route uh, and eliminate that big uh, westerly uh, loop which is the bull stake stream uh, so next we will see this a bit more clearly in a moment uh, like there so the taunt map, which is a more modern one that you're seeing there, you can perhaps get the idea a bit more clearly. You've got the lock shown right at the top of the map. Uh, Tumbling Bay is where uh, the split occurs. And so rather than doing that loop round to the left there, uh, the main River Thames from 1790 goes down to where Osney Lock, Osney L is shown on that map. And again, it's Daniel Harris using convict labor uh, which uh, is uh, who, who was instrumental in uh, not selecting the location for that lock, but um, actually uh, um, 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 completing it. Uh, and once that, that was open, then that made uh, a big difference, not only to the commerciality of moving the boats uh, up and down that part of the river, uh, but also had uh, implications for flooding because that is the lock uh, from there on, which holds back uh, the water that accumulates on Port Meadow, that enormous amount of water, that huge pound between Godstow and Osney, uh, and which um, is so significant in terms of uh, the potential for flooding of the rest of the city downstream of Osney. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's such a, a critical location in that sense, uh, not only because it's the first lock that boats coming off the Oxford Canal meet, but also uh, for that reason, uh, for um, its control of uh, waters on uh, Port Meadow itself. Um, bum, bum, bum. Yes, uh, so next we're going to carry on, I think, uh, talk a bit about, oh no, we're, okay, that's fine. Um, yes, so uh, before we do move on uh, down to uh, Woods Christchurch Meadow, uh, which I want to talk about a little bit next, uh, what happens once Osney Lock is built is that the main River Thames, the old River Thames, ceases to become a navigable waterway. Uh, it becomes much less used and ultimately it becomes impassable because of the creation of this bathing place on uh, Tumbling Bay, uh, the old Bullstake stream. So uh, again, uh, an interesting um, uh, an interesting way to, to um, manipulate a natural waterway, uh, making it look, in this image in particular, just like a, a wide canal, essentially. Next. Um, no need to dwell on this too long. It's an image I show quite a lot, in fact, uh, partly uh, to demonstrate the geographical um, 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 significance of the colleges of the of the positioning of the Oxford colleges, uh, all pretty much upwards, just just uh, situated on the river gravel terrace, making them safe from flooding. Whereas the town, the rest of Oxford, uh, the low lying suburbs of St Thomas's and St Ebbs and St Aldate's, uh, are very much still vulnerable to flooding uh, at that time, um, and still to this day, as we'll see in a moment or two. Um, carry on. Next. Uh, and one way to try to control the waters uh, downstream uh, and the south and southern part of Oxford uh, is culverting. Um, a lot of the smaller streams have vanished anyway as urbanisation has taken over. Uh, but the Trillmill stream is a particularly interesting one and one I, I talk about a lot and particularly on my walks rather than on talks actually, it occurs to me. This might even be one of the first times. But you can see in these two maps, um, uh, the, uh, 
uh, yes, the, uh, the Trill Mill stream coming in from the top left. So it uh, is flowing, it's, uh, it's Thames water, it flows off from the Castle Mill stream, uh, flows down towards Christchurch and then does this sharp bend down to the right, uh, joining the main river Thames near Folly Bridge. So that was true in 1797. It was also true in 1850. But, um, and, and it is a, undoubtedly was a, a, a contributory factor to uh, the flooding, which this part of the town uh, used to uh, be subjected to, uh, but it was more of a problem because of its um, uh, being an, essentially an open sewer. So the solution uh, next was to culvert it, was to cover it over. Um, that um, was only part of, part of you know, that certainly didn't uh, solve the problem uh, because uh, this is an image from 1852. Uh, you see similar ones from 1860 and subsequently where Port Meadow, uh, has overflowed completely. That's water going right up to the college buildings. I don't quite see it that bad anymore, but essentially the River Thames has just vanished as a river and the whole area has just become a flood, a uh, floodplain. Um, next. Um, that's one reason, that's that, you know, that, um, that, sort of habitual flooding of uh, the Christchurch Meadow is one reason why uh, the idea that Alice's shop here, which is situated just close to the now culverted Trill Mill Stream, the Trill Mill Stream is running, uh, well, just about where that park vehicle is, uh, just beyond the, the lady on the pavement. So it's, it's culverted, it goes under the, under the road now, uh, and then emerges, as you can see from the photograph, in uh, the Memorial Gardens. Um, that controls the water a little bit, but not sufficiently, I think, to uh, stop some of these shops becoming flooded. And the fact that Alice's shop almost certainly would have flooded on a fairly regular basis, I think, uh, does give some credence to the idea that uh, John Tenniel uh, used it as the model for uh, that image that I'm showing you there from uh, through the looking glass. Next. Um, but that's, is, that, that's nonetheless, you know, this idea that, that the flooding of the meadow continued through time and uh, a solution was needed on the other side of the meadow. So the Trill Mill stream comes in from the, um, uh, from the western side. Uh, the River Cherwell is uh, also creating uh, a lot of the flooding from the eastern side there. Um, and you can see actually from um, Taunt's map there, that it, there's a kind of illogicality in the way that the course of the river is, Cherwell that is, uh, where it flows sort of backwards towards the River Thames. Uh, you've got the bigger Thames coming at times of high flow, and the two rivers are kind of conflicting there, uh, and almost inevitably, therefore, uh, the meadow is going to flood. Uh, the solution was to uh, try to divert the main part of the river uh, Chowell's water away uh, so it joins the Thames in a more logical way. And the next image shows that uh, bit of work in uh, progress. Next. Good. I'm glad I'm remembering what order everything was. Uh, brilliant uh, photograph, as, as so many are by Henry Torn. You know, he captured these moments so brilliantly. Um, and um, uh, there it is. That's the what's called the new cut. Uh, so any maps after 1884, you will see it labelled as the new cut, designed to take water away from Christchurch Meadow. Uh, only partially successful. Next. Um, because even today, uh, even last winter, uh, if any of you wandered down to Christchurch, you would see that it was almost repeating what happened in 1860, despite all of the measures that were taken. Uh, you know, that water isn't, isn't really very close to the, it might look like it in my photo to the right there, um, but um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a fair distance away. But nonetheless, it's still clearly a big issue and flooding is something Oxford has to be very aware of to this day. And um, something that anybody who's interested in Alice should be very aware of to this day uh, can have a look in my book, uh, Alice in Waterland, which uh, tracks all of the way the rivers have influenced uh, the creation of uh, Lewis Carroll's stories. Uh, next. Uh, and just to sort of uh, go 
back up the river a little bit briefly before we uh, conclude nearly. Um, the Cherwell at Parsons Pleasure there, uh, the creation of this weir there, uh, and the rollers on the left-hand side. So that's a man-made influence on a natural river, another river, you know, very prone to flooding. Um, and what the weir does is um, create a smoother, uh, less, um, what's the word, uh, a smoother body of water. You can see, you know, it's much, it's much less, uh, the water is much less disturbed uh, mm -hmm. beyond the weir, above the weir. Um, and that then makes uh, it easier for punting and other sorts of uh, activity. Next. Um, so controlling the river a little bit in that way then has a knock-on commercial effect, which enables uh, the rest of the Cherwell to be uh, used for punting in a way which perhaps otherwise uh, would be less easy. Next. Um, to say we thought I'd finish, not quite finish at Ifly, but uh, with a, uh, an Ifly theme, uh, I think this is the penultimate slide, um, because we started with uh, that image of the flash lock, uh, which was the type of lock that you would have found all along the Thames uh, uh, until the uh, ninth, until the um, late 18th century and then 19th century, uh, except in three places. And Ifley was one of those three places where you did find uh, a pound lock. Um, and the evidence for that, uh, or the written evidence is um, from this brilliant, brilliant man, John Taylor, the water poet, who did this complete survey of the River Thames, the first one ever in 1632, uh, much of which he uh, submitted to the House of Lords. It was an official uh, government report uh, in rhyme, uh, rather to the surprise of the uh, noblemen who had commissioned it, you feel. Um, so if Lee, there was a new turnpike, so that's a, a pound lock. Uh, another at Stamford, he calls it, he means Stamford. Uh, and then the third one is at Abingdon uh, on Swift Ditch. Next. And that again, the creation of that kind of lock at Swift Ditch in particular uh, meant that uh, a bypass of Abingdon could be created. These images are all from the Environment Agency sign uh, near the location of this third of these uh, 17th century pound locks. And uh, it is the location, you can see the lower image there, that's a, a flash lock being illustrated. And then uh, the an artist's impression of what the Abingdon Swift Ditch lock uh, might have looked like above it. Uh, next, this is also where uh, another of my books uh, has a bit of a focus, uh, the Abingdon Water Turnpike murder. A murder occurred just near this uh, water turnpike house uh, near Abingdon in 1787. And um, although that book is not available, I have condensed that story into uh, Stories of Oxford Castle. Um, and sorry, this sorry for so many commercial uh, breaks on this, but you know, Christmas is for selling and buying stuff after all, isn't it? That is the main purpose after all. So I think the next slide, uh, which is not the last one, but uh, is a, um, a shameless um, advert for all of my books, all of which touch on uh, some of what I've spoken about this evening. Uh, but it's more a plug for the Museum of Oxford, which Elizabeth has already kindly mentioned, uh, newly opened, uh, needing a custom. Uh, do go and have a look. And, for, and at last, I am able to say uh, that there is one place where you can buy all of my books. That has not been the case uh, for some years now but uh, the Museum of Oxford is that location. And you still have a few days, of course, uh, if you uh, should uh, need any emergency last minute Christmas present. So uh, just to finish uh, with two slides, I think. Uh, next, yeah. Uh, so just to uh, penultimate one to explain the other quote from within my uh, title that, as I say, I rather spontaneously selected, and it comes uh, from this quote from uh, John Burns, who was on a, um, uh, a journey on a transatlantic uh, uh, vessel, apparently, at the time. And there it is. He describes the Thames as every drop of the Thames is liquid history. And just to finish with a seasonal couple of pictures. Next. Um, sorry. 
Sorry for the uh, somewhat garbled uh, beginning. Um, well, definitely um, odd beginning. Uh, we just about triumphed, I hope. Thank you very much to David for uh, doing uh, the slides. It's not how we would, either of us would ideally like to have done this talk, uh, especially for a first time. Uh, but anyway, uh, I hope you found something of interest there. And uh, thank you. staying with it.